This is Show Up as a Leader, a show from People Forward Network, helping you maximize your positive impact on the world by becoming your best, fully authentic self. Hey, everybody. Have you ever had one of those conversations where you talk to someone and you perhaps were separated at birth and there's such synergy and you riff off each other and you can just feel like you could chat for hours? Well, that's exactly what happened in my conversation with Claire Chandler. She is an executive leadership advisor, and she's the president and founder of a company called Talent Boost. And she has been working with organizations trying to help them really foster what she calls alignment, not conformity. And that's a big theme you will see going through our conversation when we talk about culture, we talk about effectiveness. Are you really looking more at alignment or are you trying to get conformity? So I think you're going to want to listen for that one. She also talks a lot about leaders being culture builders versus empire builders. So you're going to want to listen for that as well. And we're going to have a theme going through about owning your walk, which will make a whole lot more sense when you hear her opening story. There's just such realness and humanness and I think things we all can take away whether you lead yourself or you also lead yourself and others. Lots of great insights and some good laughs in this conversation as well. Well, Claire, we are just going to dive right in because I want you to start with telling this amazing story you told me when we were prepping for this that I think just sets the tone for why the heck we need to rethink how we create human workplaces and how we allow people to show up authentically. Tell me about the experience you had with your old boss telling you to tone down your walk. It was probably the final year that I was in a corporate job and I worked at the corporate headquarters of this big global company. And I think I had finally had like a two minute window to go to the ladies room because she know how it is. Like you work in corporate, your time is not your own, et cetera. And I'm walking back to my office and my boss stopped me in the hall and he said, you need to tone down your walk. It's too bouncy. It's too happy. And people are going to like wonder if you're up to something, like if you know something they don't. I'm like, huh? Okay. Thanks for that input. Good tip. And I went back to my office and I mean, I didn't, I didn't alter my walk. Now, listen, my walk has been the subject of commentary my whole life. I'm used to people either making fun of my walk, like my husband calls it my strut, but that was the first time I'd ever been stopped in the hallway and told I needed to tone it down. As I said to you when I first told you that story, it was so emblematic, I think, of a lot of corporate cultures that have the wrong idea about how to get alignment in their workforce, because alignment is wonderful, but conformity is not. Oh, okay. You have to say that again. Okay, so alignment is wonderful. That's what we are seeking in our workforce. Alignment, not conformity. And too many people with too much power confuse the two. Yes, I think that is such a powerful statement. And what struck me when you first told me that story and listening to it again, I just am like, good God. But we talk about conformity. You're being told with that walk to tone down what is unique about you, right? I have a dear friend who worked for a company that everyone knows very well and is very, very concerned about their brand. And they, back in the day, had very strict guidelines about hair color. And it had to be a quote unquote natural color. And that she had various shades of red, but it was, you know, highlights, but it was still a sort of natural color, I guess, right? She told me, oh, no, no, this is not approved hair. And I'm just like, really? But anyway, you think about, oh, you can't wear bright colors. Or I had someone a fellow director when I was in an organization at the time just said, people aren't going to take you seriously. I said, because I have to wear boring suits and no color. Anyway, alignment is more important than conformity. And I think so many people can resonate. Like I've had some of my friends say, you're too fill in the blank. You're too emotional and female, or you're too black. Can you make yourself more white? Or you're too this, or you're too that. Uh, Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. I know you're interviewing me, but I gotta, I gotta rewind that. You're too emotional and female. Yeah, you're too emotional, you're being too female, you're being too like, you know, just kind of like suck it up. Oh, yeah. It's that percentage of people who are hearing that and writing it off as it is what it is, and this is a reality we have to accept. We're not there anymore. Like, this is not the time where you have to settle for 
not owning your walk or conforming to somebody else's idea of what is normal and acceptable. Now, keep in mind in this story, to your point about dress code, this wasn't about my dress code. This was about the fact that I was expressing a unique part of my personality, literally through how I walk down the hall, because I walk with a lot of optimism because I happen to be an optimistic person. And apparently that was either irritating some people or he was feeling threatened. I'm not really sure. But let's talk about this because I do think this is a reality of how this shows up in so many other places and why we do need to change. The rules of the road are not the same as they were a few years ago. Thank goodness, because quite frankly, those rules weren't working for most people. They were working for a small minority of people who are in positions of privilege and power. What are some other ways that this toning down your walk or being told to dampen what makes you uniquely you show up and what can we do about it? Well, it is certainly catching up to a lot of corporate cultures, right? Talking about the upcoming war for talent. And we had been told and we have studied and we have researched and we knew that eventually this sort of perfect storm of the baby boomers retiring and not as many people coming into the workforce to replace them and the knowledge, you know, the brain drain and all of those sorts of things. And we've been talking about that for 20 years. We have had 20 years to prepare for the great resignation. And we haven't. And if that wasn't enough, we then had COVID to remind us that we had to get really darn flexible and fairly creative and fairly understanding about how people needed to feel safe to stay healthy and still get the work done, the mission critical work done for a company. And so all of these things were warning signs. These were tests for us as corporate climates and environments and cultures to really kind of find a different way to walk organizationally. And I think a lot of companies are kind of getting caught out now because the talent that is in your workforce has way more choices now than they did even 10 years ago to go work in a company and within a culture and among other people who get them and who invite them to own their personality. A hundred percent. And I think even as we're recording this, in some aspects, the economy is shrinking. But what you find is even in tightened economies, the most talented, gifted people that you want are those that still have mobility. So I think that when you think about losing good people or not retaining good people or not attracting good people, it's not the recession of 2007 or even the time of 2007, 2008, where people were just hanging on because they wanted a job. People are saying, you know what? Maybe I'll rethink my lifestyle. Maybe I'll downsize. Maybe I'll cash up my 401k. People are reevaluating what they're willing to put up with, what matters to them, what they want their quality of life. And so it's not just, oh, you're going to have people that are going to put up with whatever and be thankful to have a job. It's not what it was the last time we went through an economic downturn. Absolutely. And I think to your point, the right talent in your organization, the ones who are actually going to move the needle and help you achieve your mission and help you to grow and to stay competitive and all of that, they're responding to those types of corporate edicts to tone down your walk and to conform. They're making for the exit. They're not just taking in that input, deciding what to do with it and going back to their office. I mean, that story is from 2010. But now there are way more options. And what's interesting is that story for me was so emblematic of a culture that advertised for entrepreneurial spirit, but rewarded conformity. And it was one data point in a series of data points that signaled to me, it was time to move on. It was time to own my walk, do what I was passionate about, and find a way to do that where there were no compromises and no apologies for how I wanted to do it. Oh my God, you are like my sister from another mister, because I write about this in our book, but I worked for a firm at one point in time that they once upon a time did actually celebrate individuality and uniqueness and being different. And that was their claim to fame and what drew so many of us to them. And they were very supportive of me playing, writing, growing. And then they joined a larger firm and suddenly it was all about conformity. It was all about if you're not drinking the Kool-Aid and they wanted to put you in boxes and the people who didn't want to be in the box either got ushered out or found a way out because they were like, oh, heck no. And I think that happens way more than we realize. So obviously the show is called Show Up as a Leader. And while we firmly believe everybody has an opportunity to show up as a leader, whether or not we have the formal title or role, because the title or role does not make a person a leader, but we know that leaders like culture is shaped team by team. Culture is shaped 
by the formal leader's actions. And so let's talk a little bit about leaders as culture builders and what that looks like, because you have some really great thoughts around this that I think would be really valuable to people. Again, I love that you just teed this up. It's interesting because I spent the earlier part of my career within corporate, and now I am an external advisor to corporate. My mission is absolutely to take good leaders and help them become culture builders versus empire builders. I think that is another mark of the times that we are no longer looking for leaders who want to build empires. Forward-thinking organizations are looking for leaders And employees are looking to work for leaders who want to build a culture, who truly understand that culture is shaped from the top. It does not bubble up from the bottom. And whether leaders embrace that and actively help shape a culture, or they just mistakenly believe, well, culture just happens organically, culture is absolutely shaped from the behavior of the leaders at the top, from the consistency or lack thereof of what they say and what they do and how they champion and promote and incentivize alignment versus try to enforce conformity. I keep coming back to that because I think that's the black and white of what we're talking about. We need to be looking for and seeking alignment of the right people into the right roles with the right skills and motivation toward pursuing a mission that they can be in line with and that they can bring their full authentic selves into work their true unique personality, their most unique walk in ways that align with the mission. But alignment is way different than conformity. And so that's going to trigger this other soapbox moment I think we had in our earlier conversation around companies that advertise for people with an entrepreneurial spirit. Every job posting I've ever seen, one of the bullets on that posting in terms of essential requirements is they must have entrepreneurial spirit. Why on earth are you advertising for that if the first thing that you do is you hand them a job description and you say, do not color outside of these lines? If your culture does not deliver on the promise of your brand, you're going to lose all of your best people and you're not going to innovate, you're not going to grow, and you're not going to be competitive. There's so much in that. And so one, you have a culture whether you want to tend to it or not. It either could be an accidental culture or an intentional culture, but leaders do shape the culture. I know people go back and forth with this language. They talk about hiring for culture fit, but I think culture fit is about culture alignment. That's different than culture conformity. So I love how you put it where it's, we do need people who believe in our purpose. One, you have to have the purpose and values and actually live them, right? People want to be associated with strong purpose, strong values. Then it's, yes, we want diversity. Yes, we want various perspectives, right? We can honor their uniqueness, but there's alignment in that shared vision, shared belief, shared culture. And then we're going to value the uniqueness and differing perspectives and strengths and talents to get us there. That's very different than the culture fit, which is about conformity, which is about only hire people that look and think like you, only hire people that make you comfortable versus people who are going to challenge you. And I think in line with couple of your earlier observations, it does start from the top. And not only does culture get formed and built and shaped from the top down, conformity starts to get modeled from the top. And what I mean by that is as much as middle management, senior leaders, individual contributors all the way down are constantly being told to conform, to stay within this tight box, it's been my experience that in a lot of organizations, the C-level leaders are expected to conform as well. I've worked with a lot of leaders over the years, and a lot of them will come to me and say, I'm just not charismatic. How am I supposed to inspire a workforce when I'm not like that guy or that woman, right? I'm not charismatic. I'm not a naturally inspiring speaker. And I always say to them the same thing. I say, the way that you are going to inspire a following is by being as authentic to your true personality as you possibly can. And what I have seen is that a lot of leaders go the other way and they try to conform to that charismatic leader and they try to emulate what that leader does, what that leader says, and the style that they bring forth. And if it's not in alignment with their natural personality, it's not going to ring true. It's going to land with a dull thud. And I've actually seen leaders get in trouble like senior level leaders get in trouble for trying to emulate 
the natural humorous style of a charismatic leader and have it not just fall with a thud, but be offensive to people because it was not natural to them. And so this culture of conformity is also built from the top. I think leaders put so much pressure on themselves to make an impact very quickly because we also live in an age where the tenure, the average tenure of a C-suite leader is about four or five years. So there is this sense of urgency for them to establish a foothold and for them to establish a persona that can be followed so that everyone can contribute to their five or 10 year strategy, which by definition is going to outlive their tenure. And a lot of times they make the mistake of then saying, well, the best way to do that is to conform and to emulate the guy that I find the most inspiring. If that is not in alignment with what is true to you, what lights you up, how your natural personality is in your own unique walk, your people are going to sniff that a mile away and they're never going to follow you. I regularly say that people want realness and authenticity over polish and perfection any day of the week. And I think that this is where, from a development standpoint, for us as a leader, whether we're a formal people leader or not, but just as a human being, I guess, is this is why I think it's so critical that we have to do work on ourselves and know ourselves. Because so many times when I ask people, they actually can't even answer Like, what makes you authentically you? Like, I have this unique walk, or I say my favorite color is sparkle, or whatever. It's like, what are little things about you that you know are your hallmarks or your trademarks or are unique to you? And a lot of times they don't know that because they either have spent so much time conforming, they don't even know, or maybe it's too scary to look in the mirror, or they grew up with a belief that don't be selfish or whatever it is. And so, one, I think we have to do that work. And the other thing that I think is super important about what you said is that It's one thing to look at somebody that we know or don't know and admire them or go, gosh, I really like the way they said that or I like how they put that and then be able to filter it and say, okay, well, how does that resonate for me or what are pieces of that I can build off or tweak or change that feel more like me? That's different than I'm trying to copycat something. And I think that's an important distinction that we can be inspired and try something versus, hey, I'm going to copycat because you're right, that will fall flat if it's completely against who we are. And I think it can be easy to forget that, especially in this day of social media where everybody looks the same with all the same filters. It's like, what happened to the unique looks of people? How did we ever get by before TikTok, right? You know, I think it's so true. And it's interesting because I think we often take for granted that the CEOs, the C-suite leaders are people too. And I know some of your audience is going to hear that and say, Yeah, I get that. But they make the fat money like they make bank. And that may be true, but it's commensurate with their level of accountability. Like if they lead in the wrong direction, they're liable in so many different ways that we're not going to sign on for. Right. But even more so than that, they are human first. They are leaders second. And coming back to what you said a moment ago about a lot of leaders, especially very senior level leaders, not knowing the answer to the question, what is unique about you? sometimes they don't know how to assess that within themselves. And so when I first got into HR and I was in more of a talent development role, I would sit down with employees, mostly individual contributors and first-time managers, and just ask them what they wanted to do, what they wanted to be, where did they want to go in their career? And invariably they would say, you know what, it's been so long since someone asked me that question, I don't quite know the answer. And that was never the end of the conversation. That was really the jumping off point. And I think as employees, wherever we are in an organization, let's not just assume that the CEO is there to get his picture in the paper or to make multi, multi millions of dollars. That's sort of a byproduct of the accountability that he or she holds. Let's not take for granted that they're human first and maybe ask them from time to time, one, what's unique about you? What do you like to do when you're not at work? And then I think the big one, and I challenge any employee at any level of an organization to stop one of their C-suite leaders in the hall and not tell them to tone down their walk, but ask of them, why are you here? What keeps you coming back to this company day in and day out? Because I guarantee you, they are not going to say, have you seen the size of my paycheck? That's not going to be their answer. There has to be something bigger and higher and more aspirational that drives them. And I think employees in general take for granted that is what drives them. So I think every employee, wherever you are in the organization, go ask the leaders who know more than you do about where we're heading as an organization, why we're making some of the course corrections, 
that may just look like we've arbitrarily changed our minds. Ask them why they're here. Ask them what drives them. And I think through that and through their telling you, they are going to tap back into the uniqueness that lights them up. I love that. Yeah. Even like, what do we have going on or what's exciting for you right now? Right. Or what are you most proud of? Or what are you most fulfilled about? Because I do think we lose sight of the emotional attachment of why this is great or why this work matters or whatnot, because we can get stuck on all the frustrations or the interpersonal issues, whatever it might be. So I hear almost an apathy with some of the teams we work with and even with some of the leaders that might be like, well, that's never going to change or they get very resigned. And we talk about leading sideways and leading up. And what are some of the good questions you can ask to lead across and lead up? Meaning ask some of those questions, or if you don't have the clarity around purpose or strategy or priority, why can't you ask the question? But I love the way you're putting it because it's, let's tap back into that emotional aspect because we are emotional beings and find out what makes them tick. And maybe that stirs something in you or you have a different perspective of, oh, I never really realized that. And I don't think we do that enough because we tend to view people as their role or their function rather than they are a person who has hopes. They are a person who has struggles. And I don't know if you've read The Dream Manager from Matthew Kelly. It's been like forever and a day, but it's a great book that's been around for a long time. But the whole premise behind it is at what point did we stop dreaming? At what point did we forget to dream? And it's this great story. It's a business parable, but it's about like a cleaning company, a janitorial company. And when people start to have the power of dreaming, when's the last time you dream? And they even like ask your partner, ask your friends. We stop having dream oriented discussions. And sometimes it's that dream or that vision, even if it's not realistic, even if it's a pipe dream, but to have that also does something to help pull us out when we're stuck in ruts. I love that so much. And it reminds me of a story because that reconnection with the bigger dream, that is what will inspire alignment. There's this story, and I don't know if it's an urban legend or not, but he predates us, President John F. Kennedy, when he said, we're going to put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. But he was touring NASA before we had succeeded with the moon landing. And he saw a janitor doing his job and he went over to the janitor and he introduced himself and he said, what do you do here? And the janitor looked at him and replied, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. Because he understood that if he do his job, if he didn't clean the halls and make sure that the garbage was collected and there wasn't junk or germs lingering in the workplace, people might have accidents, people might get illnesses, and we might not hit our target. And if that is not an example of a connection all the way down the line in an organizational hierarchy to the greater mission, and attaching personal meaning to between pushing a broom and putting somebody on the moon for the very first time. It's just such an amazing story. And again, I don't know if that actually happened, but I would like to believe it's true. You know, as much as being told to tone down my walk was emblematic of the culture in which I was living, that conversation, whether true or not, is so emblematic of the way it should be. And whether it's true or not, I will say it reminds me of something that I know is true, which is Amy Resnuski is known for doing incredible research in the area of job crafting. And they've done tremendous research with hospital cleaning crews. And they found a profound difference of people where they would say, oh, it's just a job for them versus more of a call in your career. And you would talk to someone, they would say they actually viewed themselves as part of the care team, which is true because infection, et cetera. And so if you think about job crafting and you think about each one of us, it reminds me of Imperative does great work around a purpose mindset. And they talk about that every single one of us has an opportunity to find meaning and fulfillment in our work. And you might think, oh, it's easier if someone's a teacher or a healthcare worker or fill in the blank or works for a nonprofit. Again, it goes back to if I feel that I'm part of something bigger, which gets back to your alignment, right? If I feel like I am a piece of the puzzle that is critical for X, Y, Z, for us to live into our purpose, then I matter. And my work is not irrelevant versus I'm just here to conform and just do someone's bidding and I don't matter and I'm just a number. It's a very different experience at work. And I think what this is bringing back up for me is the importance of every single people leader, wherever you are in the organization. First of all, culture is not the CEO's job. It's not HR's job. It's everybody's job. But if you have formal people leadership responsibilities, you have an incredible responsibility because of the influence you have over culture and experience. And so if you're not having conversations on a regular basis to reinforce and reaffirm how people's work matters and explicitly help them connect it to organizational goals and purpose, if you assume they know or you did it once, mm, 
not going to cut it. And I think if you're an individual, what's coming up for me is if you don't know, what do you find fulfilling? Like, can you ask the question of your boss or how do you see this work fitting in or how does this connect? What's the connective tissue? What's the context? So that you can find that for yourself if you don't know what it is or you've lost it. I love that. And I could not agree with you more. I think the higher up in an organization a person ascends in terms of being responsible for other people, the more their role should heavily be focused on being that connector, making connections for people individually between what lights them up and how that connects to the greater mission across teams, right? Because I think too often silos sort of form kind of the primordial ooze, right, of an organization. It's too easy to just keep your head down, do your work, and just wait out the latest leader, the latest mission statement, all of those sorts of things. But I also love that to some extent, put the challenge back to the employees. It is largely an excuse to say, my ability to affect my role or to contribute in bigger ways is beyond my control because I'm not a manager, I'm not a leader, I'm not the person in the corner office. And I'm going to have to call BS on that because I think you were 100% right. It is completely within our control as individual employees or consultants or value contributors in the world to find and attach meaning between what we do and why that matters. And if you can't figure it out for yourself, go ask somebody and have them help you make that connection. And if it's still not there, don't settle for that. Because I think that is part of the reason that conformity succeeds because too many people convince themselves that this is just the way it is, right? There's a reason that the saying goes, well, if we were supposed to enjoy our job, we wouldn't call it work, right? That's just garbage. Get away from that. We are not on this earth for very long. You don't have to settle for a job that makes you miserable. You don't have to settle for being told to tone down your walk. You don't have to settle for any of that especially in this day and age. And the forward-looking organizations are starting to understand that they've got to get flexible with how they attract, retain, harness, and motivate talent, whether those are full-time people, part-time people, the gig economy, contractors, freelance, whatever you want to call it. They're starting to understand that it is not about amassing the biggest population of full-time employees. It's about tapping into collective talent and inspiring and harnessing that toward the achievement of a higher mission that we didn't think we could reach. That's what it's all about. And you know, what's interesting is going back to how we define leadership, which is maximizing our positive impact on the world by becoming our best fully authentic self and supporting those around us to break past barriers and step into their greatness. And why I love what you just said and why I'm going back to that definition is in this day and age, it's so easy to sit back and be like, oh, not my problem. And then just be apathetic or on the blame game of, oh, leaders suck or this organization sucks or the strategy sucks or whatever, versus choosing to show up as a leader and either see if you can be part of leading and influencing positive change around you or find alignment. And I get like, I want to be really clear. There are people who are in situations where they have to work three or four jobs and that's not possible. And this is speaking a little bit from a place of privilege, but even in some of those jobs, is there another fill in the blank that might treat you better? And so there's very real constraints, but if we start to have that mindset of regardless of industry, like people deserve to be treated like human beings and every single one of us deserves to have an opportunity to contribute. Gone, I feel like are the days of sitting back going, not my problem, because how deflating is that to feel like you're not in the driver's seat of your own life? And even if it's, you can influence this, or you can talk about this, or you can find a connection here, or if this place truly sucks, might take a little bit of time, but can you find another place that will treat you better so that you can make that transition and still care for your household and care for your needs? But I do think you're right. I think that is a fundamental shift of perspective and era. And it's not just people with the power, with the authority, with the paycheck that need to show up as leaders right now. A hundred percent. And between the great resignation, the ongoing war for talent, there has never been a better time for employees to exercise their free will, own their walk, and either help to influence and impact the culture they already work within or find one that truly embraces them. Speaking of owning our authenticity, owning our walk, et cetera, one of the things that I've learned that gets in our way of doing that and part of my obsession with normalizing the messiness of being human is that we tell ourselves stories that keep us safe and small, that tell us it's not okay. 
to own our walk or that I can't speak up here or I don't deserve better or whatever it might be. And so in the spirit of modeling courageous vulnerability, Claire, I would love if you would be willing to share what is a self-limiting story that you still tell yourself sometimes and when you do or when it shows up, how do you move beyond it so that you can still own your walk and show up as a leader? I love that question because it really invites me to be vulnerable, which is not something that I get to demonstrate terribly much because as the person who was brought in to help corporate cultures strengthen, it's not really about me. So it's kind of interesting. I think the biggest self-limiting story that I have had ever since becoming an entrepreneur slash consultant is who am I to do this? Like, who am I to think that I can succeed as an entrepreneur or be out on my own? You know, I've been a corporate employee my whole career. Like, who am I to walk into a large corporate environment and tell them that I know better? And I think it's my version of imposter syndrome or fraud complex or whatever you want to say, but it's those voices that get loudest between me closing my car door and walking toward the entrance of a client site. The one that wants to shout down the confidence and the bounce to my walk to say, better not walk in there too confident because what if today's the day that they realize that you're not all that? And I think it's part of what risks you suppressing that bounce to your step or that walk. And what's been interesting is I have only continued to get validation that my walk, my unique personality, my quirky sense of humor, my non-corporate, non-HR way of relating to corporate HR people is what gets me invited back month after month, meeting after meeting, year after year, because they realize that the way over their obstacles and through to the other side is not by continuing to conform to the way that they've always tried to solve their problems. It's to get out of their own way and to have conversations at a different level, at a deeper level. It's no longer about, oh my gosh, is today the day they're going to like call me out? It's more about they are investing a day, a week, whatever, into making their culture better Am I going to deliver the value that they're looking for? And it keeps my game sharp. That adrenaline is what propels me forward and makes sure that I don't conform either to their expectations or to the way I've always done things. And I'm constantly questioning and reassessing and trying to strengthen my game. So I play full out. So I never doubt that if I stumble, it wasn't because I held back. It's because I went for the moon. We have a saying in the Dare to Lead work we do that when you sign up to be a daring leader, when you sign up to be courageous, you're going to fall down. It's not an if, it's a when. And so it's what do you do when that happens and how do you equip yourself to get back up? I don't know that I knew that you were a Dare to Lead certified. Brene Brown is my spirit animal, right? And I'm sure like she is for so many people, but that explains the sort of wry smile you showed me when I talked about vulnerability. The work that she has done standing in front of hundreds of accomplished business executives and talking about vulnerability and getting them within a very short time to get over themselves. You know, it's interesting. I was asked to speak at a conference to women leaders about the unique challenges that they face. And in the planning for that talk, the more we talked about it, I said, you know, I'm happy to just address women leaders if that's who you're inviting to this event, but understand something. The, the challenges that they are going through that I plan to talk about are the same ones that their male counterparts have brought up to me. And so they realized they had to scrap the whole marketing of it and then cast a wider net. And God love them. They were so well-intentioned, but it was like, the thing is, let's not continue to carve out women like they're this fragile subset of leadership that has to be treated differently. That's part of the reason we keep getting pulled aside and told to stop walking the way that we walk. Let's not do that. Let's not have different standards because I'm a female or because you're a minority or something like that. My point being, the things we tell ourselves, the self-limiting beliefs, the, well, I can't be vulnerable because that admits to weakness, those are not unique to women. No, they're human. They're universal. Yes, Oh, yeah. I mean, I work with a whole lot of leadership teams in a whole lot of industries, and 
I think Brene is true. It's not fear that gets in our way of being courageous. It's armor and armor actually plagues innovation. It plagues growth because it's the strategies we use to protect ourselves. It's impression management that profoundly gets in our way. And I see it over and over and over. And when leaders hit those junctures and those struggling points, whether they realize it or not, it's usually their own hardwiring of self-protection kicking in that they don't realize. And so we have to unpack that. And if they would just reach for true, genuine vulnerability, that is what's relatable. People don't follow you because you're charismatic. They follow you because they see something in you that they want to learn more about and they want to experience more of. Show them that. Don't put on a shiny suit and do a fancy speech and tell a great joke that's going to land, you know, like a mic drop. If you can naturally do that, then go for it. If not, be vulnerable and be humanly relatable because that's what people are going to follow. We connect with people and lean into people through our shared humanity. And I think when those stories get the best of us, I think we forget that. And so it's reminding ourselves, right? Going back to people, even I think the times where I stopped sharing my story or do people want to hear that and you share something or you share something vulnerable and here's the thing, there's a commonality around it and people connect to it because we see ourselves in other people's stories that go back to the dawn of time, people sitting around, you know, a fire, it's storytelling. I mean, that's how we connect is through story and through sharing of ourselves. So love that. Okay. So speaking of sharing of yourself, are you ready for quick questions? Yeah, do it. This is going to be a perfect one. Fill in the blank. Living authentically is? The only way to go. The only way to lead yourself and anybody else. And owning your walk, right? Yeah, absolutely. When the world is presenting an opening that you don't feel like showing up as a leader, what do you do? You give yourself permission to sit with that feeling for a little bit until you feel differently. You know, I think as leaders, whether they are officially leaders because they have that title or they are leaders of self, I think too often, again, Brene uses this word armor. It's so true. We use a full calendar as armor to walk around and get back in touch with why we're really here. And I think there are days when even CEOs don't really feel like showing up as a leader and they would all be better served if they sat with that for just a little bit and gave themselves permission to get some space and to reflect and to reconnect to that side of them that will be a leader. Because if they show up and they're not a leader and they're not feeling it, that mood and that energy is just as infectious. 100%. We have to give ourselves permission to feel all the feels, even the uncomfortable ones, right? And to pause. Love it. What is something people would be surprised to know about you? I am the proud mom of a chinchilla. He is my office buddy. He actually has more YouTube followers than I do. He's got a channel where he dispenses leadership tips every weekday. So you should go check him out. Okay. What's the channel? What's his name? It's called Chin Up Leadership. He has been doing that since the beginning of the pandemic, when we couldn't really go out and do anything, he posts something on Facebook and on YouTube every morning. Oh my God. I love that so much. That is fantastic. Okay. What is your favorite go-to movie? It really depends on the mood that I'm in. The answer to the question of what is my favorite all-time movie is always Shawshank Redemption. Yes, I realize it's a prison movie, but there is this redemptive quality where the guy gets the better of this really toxic leader. So I kind of like that. But, you know, there's other movies that whenever they're on, I go, oh, crap, why did I turn on the TV? Because now my day is shot, right? American President, Godfather 1 or 2, Casino, Hunt for Red October. There's like a bunch of them. The Holiday. Love it, love it, love it. What is your go-to song? All-time favorite, gets me car dancing, singing, whatever, I don't care where I am, is Earth, Wind & Fire's September. It is the reason that I was married on the 21st night of September. Oh my God, that's awesome. What is something you can't live without? It's love. I got married late in life, didn't know if it was in the cards for me and had started to convince myself I was destined to be single and I wasn't lovable and all of that stuff. Now that I've been shown a different way, won't trade it. Love that. What is something in your ordinary daily life that makes your heart happy? It's really my chinchilla. He is just this little mush ball. When I let him out of his cage in the morning and he jumps around, He makes this chirping sound when he's super happy. And I say this to him almost every day. I'm like, you bring me such joy. I love that so much. And what are you grateful for right now? I truly am genuinely grateful for the ability to help my clients without getting 
sucked back into the corporate machine, like that I can help them from the outside, that I've been doing this now since 2011, which was almost an experiment. It was sort of the, well, I'm going to try this for a while. didn't really have a plan. I might fall flat on my face and I would not change it for the world. I am so grateful that I am able to do what I love, to walk the way that I want and to spend time with people that I deeply care about. That's awesome. Okay. Closing question. Claire, if you could challenge leaders everywhere to practice this one behavior that would create more human workplaces and equip everyone to show up as a leader, what would that be? Easy. It's own your walk. Never tone down your walk. You have to model the behavior you want to see repeated. You have to build and shape culture. Your people take their cue from you and they are hungry to follow leaders that they can relate to own your walk and let other people do the same. I'm Rosie Ward, and this is Show Up as a Leader. To learn more, head over to peopleforwardnetwork.com and of course, hit that follow button.